So thanks for that great talk and for the whole session. We'd like to invite all the speakers up so that we can have some discussion. There's some microphones on the floor, and it looks like we have our first question. Raul, we'll, don't worry about the chair. Shadu? Yeah. I, I just want to thank all of those speakers. Those were, those were excellent. I really enjoyed that. Um, I'm fascinated. We've all seen the, the variation in the product that we turn out as a resident. And I believe, again, I'm a fellowship director, we're not residency director, and I think they all have to sign a form that says this person, individual, can practice independently general surgery. I'm not going to say the name of a, of a general surgery program director in the country who says I'm lying every time I sign that certificate. I don't know if I said every time, but a lot of the times. But, I'm, I, but as a fellowship director, I'm interested that, I'm fascinated that the fellow applicants, when they interview, I say, what do you want to get out of the fellowship? What do you want? They're focusing on technical skills, cases, and confidence. I've never had one say, I want to become, you know, a, you know, a content expert in the management of, you know, metabolic and obesity and disease and things like that. They, they don't, it's, it's so technically focused. And uh, of course, that's not what my goal is. I want to turn out a product that encompasses all of what all of what you guys are sharing. What do you do with the, and we've all had experiences where we see all the, the second year resident who technically was actually probably better than our, some of our like fourth year residents at times. But one's a four and one's a two, and so this case is yours and that's it. So what do you do with the individual who, uh, can do all of those components, the pre-op, the care, I can, they can manage the complications, they can do all of that, but they are really behind technically on, let's say, inguinal hernia or appendectomy or colectomy. I mean, where, where will that fall in? Is that person being held back? Or, you know, I'm open to just everyone's comments on how, we, how do we turn out a better product? Yap, do you want to try to take a stab at that question? Of course, there's a wide uh, variation between the residents. So, what I showed this morning is on average, and uh, when there, there is such a resident who's uh, falling behind, you know, you take them uh, by the hand and uh, uh, get them, get him or her more cases. So, there's, there's a curriculum of uh, six years in total. Uh, during the four, first four years, we try to get them ready. But there's a there's a wide variation of uh, programs. Rebecca, did you have anything different? Yeah, I think um, I think a couple important things. One, they come focused on numbers of cases because that's what we've focused on. That's what we've measured so far. Um, I think to your point about that that resonant where and what we've seen in some of the other specialties, it's really fantastic about EPAs is those people become visible a whole lot earlier. Right now, they get passed through and you don't really identify the problems. If they have to be entrusted on just one of the EPAs we're starting on, you know, managing a evaluating and managing a patient with lingual hernia, which includes doing the operation, there's a spotlight on that now. And they will be picked up a whole lot earlier. They probably do need additional cases. They, maybe they need to do mental training. Maybe they don't see the nodes of the case. You know, there are lots of different reasons for it, but you can identify it so then you can start to troubleshoot it. I think one of the great um, things about EPAs and about Trustman is that they, they can't be entrusted until they they can meet all of those you know, milestones, which are buried in the EPA. And by defining what that looks like, now we're measuring it. Just the same way we've measured cases, now we're measuring that. So there's going to be greater attention, both from the residents and the program director. It also gives that program director now a tool to say, you know what, you, you were entrusted in these five EPAs, but you haven't made it in these three. It gives them some tools to, to not have to sign that form, because we don't really have any right now. Thank you. Eugene? Two questions real quick, Dr. Bunyik. Um, I was also at your general marks doctor earlier, and you mentioned it shouldn't take 25 years to train a surgeon. And my question then is, and actually that might have been a different lecture, I'm sorry. So the, my question is, if you have a trainee who meets all the criteria and meets all the EPAs at six months, instead of the traditional five or six years, what do you do with that person? Do they then just work for the, the next five years? Do they, you give them their credentials and they're done there, and you pat them on the back and they go? For Dr. Minter, um, the question for your relationship with the board, um, I think we all agree that EPAs are probably a better way to measure residency competency, resident competency, but perhaps they're also a better way to measure surgery competency. So is there any will or desire or interest on the part of the board in replacing the current main certification 
with uh, an EPA-based evaluation. Thank you very much. In the Netherlands, we have now a leeway of six months on a six years uh, residency. So if someone is really advancing quickly, you can graduate as residence half a year earlier. Of course, it could be shorter. And I believe uh, in Toronto, uh, to the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, uh, there is more flexibility in terms of shortening uh, the training uh, periods. So actually in Toronto now, they've gone to back to the fixed period because they were struggling a little bit with the, the time variable. But um, you're exactly right. If they, if they get there, um, or if they don't get there, then they have to go back. Right now, they're just getting extra practice before they go out. But obviously, the goal would be to have a time variable approach for sure. It's just tricky how to do that. Um, for the board, I think there's absolutely an appetite for that. We're just dipping our toe in the water right now. I will tell you that for pediatrics and internal medicine, sort of somewhere in between, um, for pediatrics, it spans the entire continuum now, as in the Netherlands, for EPAs from medical school to maintenance of certification. So there are definitely models in the states that are coming for that. In surgery, I think um, there's like John Hunter, Mary Klingen Smith, Steve Evans. There's a lot of enthusiasm for this approach, but again, we're just getting started. Um, and we're starting with residency. Just one follow-up comment on that. With a fellowship curriculum, Nin Nguyen actually was able to get his fellow certified to do sleeves independently as a fellow. So we are trying to shift that bar a little bit with the training. Um, Dr. Ducoin. Yeah, uh, great conversation by everybody today. And this is a little off the EPAs, but back to the kind of the preoperative mental preparation Dr. Uh, Rosenthal was talking about. Um, we were just talking in the back, and we still, uh, I'll review cases and videos before I go into the operating room. Um, and SAGE is being such a video-based society. Uh, have we thought of using that kind of modality and uh, preparing residents for um, cases, having them actually review, you know, short six-minute clips of, you know, the pertinent parts of a surgery? And if so, do we know any data regarding that that we could really push that forward? Yeah. <clears throat> To the point that was raised before regarding Chanu about the resident that is technically not so good. You know, when I look at the residents and fellows, I have there are three aspects I look at them: knowledge, technique, and personality. And nobody has a dress of our personality, which is a very difficult one. Uh, because you're gonna have a guy who's a great kid, knows a lot, but is a disaster in the operating room, and you have the other one who is outstanding in the operating room but it is uh, literally uh, an obnoxious individual when talking to patients or peers. Uh, so this is a very, very difficult task. And I think what we're hearing today, we have to develop EPAs for an individual as, you know, in decision-making and how he or she is as a person. Regarding the video, uh, yes, there is a lot of work going on uh, at different levels in how can you, for instance, at ASMBS, when you submit a video, I, we are requesting that you divide that video in approach, dissection, resection, reconstruction, you know, documentation, uh, how you, you know, evaluate that, that operation you just did. Uh, and I think it's important, again, to create steps, nodal points, uh, so that the resident, the trainee, can go one by one and not show them a video how to do a Whipple because they can see a video how Dr. Minter does a Whipple, but they miss a lot just by watching. They need to understand the step by step by step. And it goes so in detail that there are even descriptions in how you move your hands to put in a choker, how you position the choker, uh, how you hold the needle holder with your right, with your left hand, how you move your elbow. There are gloves that have been developed that are hooked up to computers that will read the different motion that you do to do the one or the other task. Uh, we are, I think, decades away of being able to translate that into education, but the work starts somewhere, somehow, uh, with what I just told you or show you today. Yeah. Uh, and I've been a big fan of Rawls work in that, and, and I think I was one of those attendees a few years ago at the panel. And um, I think you did highlight that it improves technical skills, but heart rate data, this data that says mental training and rehearsals lowers anxiety, lowers performance anxiety, lowers the heart rate. So I think there's something there, and I don't think it's been fully explored. We welcome your ideas at SAGES, you know, and applaud the work being done at ASMBS. We'll move on to the next comment. Hi, Ann Rogers. 
Um, I think it's great. The topic is great, and I love the uh, focus on competency over time spent. But having been both a general surgery program director and a fellowship director, we all know there's that occasional superstar who will never be competent. So will this not then uh, <laughs> justify their requesting further time in fellowship? We, we are limited in time in that way. Yes, you're, and you're absolutely right. And I think um, there, uh, like his name is Eric Worm, he's an um, internal medicine, med uh, medicine program director who's implemented EPAs at Cincinnati. And his attrition rate is exactly the same as it's always been in his residency, but he hasn't had to fire anyone beyond the second year now for the last five years because mm -hmm. he's identified them early. Um, and I think the individual you're describing those signals are there from the very beginning, but they have these other great attributes, and so we move them forward, we move them forward. And I think one of the things I like about the concept of EPAs is it really starts to objectify and make less emotional some of these decisions that we have to make. And while I said there's not, um, the way that we're looking at it isn't just having a final sort of high stakes assessment, but there can be high stakes um, assessment decisions where if you haven't, gotten to a certain point within whatever degree standard deviation you think is reasonable that you just say someone's not going to going to get there and i think you have to be transparent about what those are they can't be a surprise um, but i would hope that as we start to develop some better measures and some and better do a better job setting the expectations which is the other thing we haven't done well is to tell them what they have to be able to do by x point um, plus or minus whatever it might be that we'll do a better job with this because when, once they're PGY-4, really it's people aren't really willing to let them go at that point. And then you sign the form. <laughs> Yop, could you comment? I mean, you guys got so much more experience than we do in this, um, in this uh, country. Have you guys found it um, useful and feasible to identify those folks uh, at an earlier stage? Well, don't. I don't know for sure whether there, our system uh, helps us to pick them up earlier. It probably does because, for instance, in the first uh, year of residency, we uh, uh, we have an interview every three months, and we document that. And then uh, at the end of year one, the program director needs uh, to decide whether the resident will go on to be a PGY2, and the same after two years. So, so there might be a mere, more of a of a radar there to uh, pick it up, and uh, our attrition rate is somewhere between five and ten percent. Mostly people uh, leaving uh, in the first uh, two years, and many of them leave uh, spontaneously because they feel more comfortable in our specialty. Great. I have a question for Raoul. Yeah. Um, if you want to do visual training and you haven't done it before, this mental training, how do you get your fellows to start doing that? How do you incorporate that into your program? Yeah, well, what I suggest is probably not with the fellows, but you can do it with your residents, uh, just to convince yourself. You know, take a resident, uh, have them watch a couple of appendectomies, and let them do the appendectomy, and they take, take another resident and explain them step by step by step by step how you do that appendectomy. You will be, you know, so surprised how quickly the other resident, how confident he or she is when they walk into the operating room. They ask for the right instruments. You know, every Monday afternoon I sit with them and I do uh, just technique. So I say, okay, show me your preference card. You're going to do a, an inguinal hernia. What's your preference card? I mean, they don't even ask you for a knife. And when you tell them, okay, I'm going to put a knife, what blade do you want? They don't know what a 15 blade is or how big it is. And then you ask them for the suture. They don't know the, the size of the needle. Uh, if you go, if you dissect all these little pieces, uh, it is mind-blowing. And I believe that it's going to have an impact in how, how, how long we train our residents. Now, I would ask... Any of you, would you put a stamp today if I tell you that I can train a surgical resident in three years? Who said that they need to be five years in training? I mean, these kids, after five years, they're dizzy. They've been in colorectal, in thoracic, in ICU, in the trauma, in the ER. They've been in MIS. But by the time they come and they're chief residents, they're with you as a fellow. They don't even know how to put an incision to do an inguinal hernia. 
they're not sure where to put their cuts, you know, so that they're not too medial or too lateral. So, but to answer your question, I think the way to start is to take an operation, as I show you the appendectomy, divide it in nodal points, take those nodal points, divide it in subnodal points, and go over those with a resident. Anecdotal, Alan Siperstein, who is the past president of the Society of Endocrinology in the United States, I was with Alan with all this, and Alan thought that I'm smoking something, and a year later came to me and said, you know what, well, it works. I take them to my office before I do a thyroidectomy. I dissect all the steps with them, and they're different surgeons. People that are high-level golfers or target shooters, because they already go through that same iterative process. Perhaps it translates across the ability to visualize. Yeah. Funny. I, I, final question I'd like to ask to Corey. You know, um, it was referenced earlier, I had the privilege of hearing Nim Nguyen give um, the GSAC a, a, an update on the wonderful pilot work that you guys are doing. And he said that in his position as interim chair in his department, he was able to work with the credentialing committee. And he had his fellow mid-year doing um, independently credentialed uh, for sleeve gastrectomy. Can you comment on that as part of the vision of what the ASMBS curriculum is looking like or the possibilities around incremental uh, credentialing? So absolutely, and, and we've talked about that. Um, the, the concept, and, and Rebecca made mention to it, is particularly in fellowship, but it may even work at the earlier levels, is the idea that once you can demonstrate that someone is entrustable to perform the activity, could you then go to your credentialing organization and get them privileges? It's probably actually easier at the fellowship level. Uh, some of us already fund our fellowships by, say, getting them clinical instructor privileges, but most of them get, and I think Min had done this, he got clinical instructor privileges already for his fellow, but they were only privileged to do general surgery, and his fellow took EGS call. So then once his fellow attained entrustability in sleeves, they went back and simply needed to expand the privilege list for that fellow. He and I actually discussed it at the college because he was planning to do it, and he asked if I was planning to do it. But I don't fund my fellows by getting them clinical instructor privilege. So once my fellows were entrustable at that level, I would have had to start the entire credentialing process in November and it would be now before they actually got it, and it's not a financially feasible model at my organization. And so as each of the pilot organizations has looked at doing it, I think NIN is the only one who moved forward with it. But it certainly um, makes, I think, all of us think about, uh, depending on how you fund your fellows, is that something you want to think about doing? And I think that's an important concept at a fellowship council level for Absolutely. us to keep in mind. Well, just since it's 1.30, we're going to wrap it up. And I'm really sorry, but thank you so much for a great panel discussion.